Welcome back to the Arise interview, where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyegolu. Now let's talk about a powerful and absorbing new book by the internationally acclaimed distinguished American journalist, author and professor at Columbia University, Howard French. The book is titled Born in Blackness, Africa, Africans and the Making of the Modern World world 1471 to the Second World War. It's an absolute tour de force that lays bare the scale of the West's exploitation of Africa in the pursuit of economic power. It's a sort of passionate retelling of Eurocentric history, a history which Mr. French says has not only ignored the people and cultures of Africa, but has so miscast them that the story of the global past and the age of discovery has become part of a profound mistelling. He says that the impetus for what turned into the creation of multiple European empires stretching across continents did not come from the yearning for ties with Asia, but from a centuries-old desire to forge trading ties with legendary rich black societies in Africa that were home to huge quantities of gold and an inexhaustible source of labor. It was along Africa's western coast that Europeans perfected techniques of map making and navigation, where ship designs were tested and improved, and where sailors learned to understand the winds of the Atlantic Ocean. How incredible is that? Well, for more on this, I'm suitably delighted to say that the distinguished writer and journalist Howard French joins me now on the line from New York. Absolutely delighted to see you, Mr. French. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time to talk to us. Um, let me start by asking you to tell us more about the central focus and main argument of your book, which many critics that I've read say is absolutely masterfully put together. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be with you. Um, I guess the best place to start is at the beginning, um, and it is at the beginning of this history uh, in the 14th century that um, typical accounts of the arrival of the West in modernity begin to go astray. Um, we have mostly been taught that, as you said in the intro, that the West became interested in exploration, especially Spain and Portugal, because they were seeking sea routes to Asia. Um, the reality is that um, in 1324, the king uh, from the Mali Empire named Mansa Musa set out for Mecca and stopped in Cairo, uh, where, uh, or along the way uh, to which he distributed uh, as much as 15 tons of gold. He had a caravan including 60,000 people, and this created um, uh, uh, tales about Malian wealth that quickly spread into uh, Europe and throughout uh, the Western world um, and set um, off a kind of excitement uh, in Europe and in Iberia in particular in order to try to discover the source of this African wealth. But this led later in that century, in 1375, to the creation of a modern atlas named the Catalan Atlas, which appears on the cover of my book beautiful document and shows a black African king seated on a golden throne, holding a golden scepter and an orb of solid gold, uh, receiving visitors. Um, this led uh, Prince Henry the Navigator, uh, Portugal, uh, Portuguese uh, prince of the early 14th century, uh, I'm sorry, the early 15th century to send ships down the coast of Africa. And they eventually, um, after some decades, actually somewhat after uh, Henry the Navigator's death, arrive in what is now modern day Ghana, where you discover an extraordinary supply of gold. And this kicks off a number of historically crucial events. First of all, it begins the kind of economic integration within Europe on the basis of new, the new availability of specie or gold derived from Africa in huge quantities. It then enables Portugal, which was a marginal country up until that point, to become a maritime power. Portugal and Spain fight a war for control of African gold off the coast of West Africa, tiny Portugal wins, uh, and then Portuguese exploration then expands throughout much of the world, ultimately decades later ending up in Asia, 
But before uh, they arrive in Asia, Spain, uh, which is covetous of Portugal's success, funds the voyages of Christopher Columbus, um, which allows uh, Columbus to, of course, arrive in the so-called New World. Um, the, the, the next stage of this, uh, this grand narrative is that um, uh, the Europeans gradually begin a turn from African gold, which absolutely transforms their economy toward the employment of people taken as slaves from the African continent. And uh, the invention of a plantation model of slavery using chattel labor, C-H-A-T-T-L-E, labor, chattel meaning like cattle, um, uh, first in Sao Tome, then secondly in Brazil, and then from Brazil into the Caribbean, starting in Barbados, absolutely uh, served as a kind of rocket fuel for Europe's takeoff and separated Europe from the rest of the world, the great civilizational centers of India and China, and made Europe the rich and powerful continent that we know it to have become, uh, as well as uh, founded or funded uh, the takeoff of North America, especially what became the United States, which were reliant on Caribbean trade, uh, trade with the slave economies of the Caribbean for their sustenance. Well, I, mean, I have to say that just listening to you range with extraordinary ease across so many centuries of history is absolutely fascinating. It clearly suggests that you, you've got a very good grasp and you did your, your sort of homework very well. But basically, your point is that the beginning of the age of exploration and the creation of the modern world started with the Spanish and the Portuguese sourcing for gold in West Africa and not with the much more publicized attempt by the Europeans to access the wealth of the East. I mean, how did you come to that conclusion? And I hope I'm not making you repeat yourself because the, the, your sound was a little bit distorted for a little bit here. Sorry about the sound. Um, I, what I would say, so my previous book was about um, Chinese history and how uh, China regards has, has drawn on its long, rich history um, uh, as a way of uh, mobilizing its national energies for, for preeminence in the world today. And as I researched that book, I became very interested in the 15th century uh, in global nav navigation. In the 15th century, the Chinese had a grand uh, fleet of exploration led by a eunuch named Zheng He, who arrived famously all the way to the coast of East Africa. And this was only a few decades away from the subsequent exploration of the Indian Ocean by the Portuguese. And so this led me uh, deep, more deeply into a research of maritime history, and I began to discover that the most famous navigators of the West, including Christopher Columbus, cut their teeth, so to speak. They received their training um, not in trying to seek a way to Asia, but in the early decades of the 15th century, uh, or mid-decades of the 15th century, trying to understand the sea currents around the west coast of Africa, where the kings of Spain and Portugal, especially Portugal, were determined to try to find the sources of African wealth, which they had learned of because of this famous Catalan atlas. Well, as I said, I mean, it's just absolutely fascinating listening to you go through that history. So how did things degenerate from those tales from the Iberians of these incredible, wonderful African kings and their fabulous wealth and their kingdoms full of gold to African backwardness, which is how Europe has viewed Africa over a long period of time because according to your book there was no shortage of quite sophisticated african states in africa in the 15th century correct uh, you had the empires of sudanic or sahelian africa including in uh, what is now northern nigeria in mali in senegal in mauritania you had very uh, you had uh, the kingdom of benin you had um very strong kingdoms in Ghana and other parts of West Africa. And of course, uh, one of the examples I developed most uh, in the greatest depth in my book, you have the Kingdom of Congo, which actually had diplomats located in Europe in the 15th and 16th century. Um, 
I think it's important to stress that the Europeans did not originally take Africans to be backwards at all. I think that this has become a post facto narrative that has been elaborated and sustained and emphasized, uh, as best I can understand it, as a mechanism to absolve Europeans for responsibility, morally speaking, for the exploitation of, of, of Africa that, that, that followed, and especially uh, the exploitation or the, um, uh, the uh, um, repression uh, expressed through slavery of African lives. We get this number uh, of, uh, commonly used to, to quantify the slave trade, which says that 12.5 million Africans were brought across the Atlantic, but this vastly underestimates the extent of what became the transatlantic slave trade. Many, many more millions of Africans died in the African environment being brought by traders from one place or another, typically somewhere inland from the coast to coastal ports for shipment to the Americas. So that adds on top of the 12.5 million people. Then um, as many as 15 or 20% of Africans in some cases died at sea before they landed in the Americas. Um, so that must come also on top of the 12.5 million. And then in most plantation economy environments, whether in Brazil or the Caribbean or the American South, there was something that was known as the seasoning period, when whites uh, took the newly arrived slaves and placed them sort of in an initiation of slavery uh, that lasted often from uh, one to two years. And a great, for largely for epidemiological reasons, a great many Africans died under those circumstances as well, under the stress of this sort of um, training to become slaves. And so the death toll of, of, of the slave trade is uh, immeasurably larger than the 12.5 million, which is already a horrible number. But this deterioration, as you uh, called it, begins um, in part through a, 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 a series of historical coincidences. So when the Europeans were just discovering about the existence of Mansa Musa and the Mali Empire, which, which controlled such massive amounts of slaves, by the time the Europeans got down the coast, the Iberians and Henry the Navigator's man and his successors reached Elmina. By coincidence, the Mali Empire, which was very extensive and very populous, had already um, succumbed to an invasion by forces from Morocco. So another African power from North Africa had defeated the Malian Empire in war just on the eve of the arrival of the Europeans. And this weekend... West okay, I, I'm just going to ask you, I, I'm really sorry to interrupt you, to hold on. We've got to take a break, but we will come back and continue from where you stopped there. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with the writer and journalist Howard French about his new book titled Born in Blackness. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Inyagulu. Now, the writer, journalist, and very distinguished foreign correspondent, Howard French, is my second guest today on the program. He's the author of the new book, Born in Blackness, Africa, Africans, and the Making of the Modern World. As a foreign correspondent, Mr. French reported from many parts of Africa, the Caribbean, and many places beyond. His travels, research, and contacts across the world have led him to reconsider the role of African states and black nations such as Haiti, North Africa, West Africa, and all the rest of it in world history. His new beautifully, masterfully written book, Born in Blackness, sets out to reveal what he calls the central yet intentionally obliterated role of Africa in the creation of modernity. It offers a wider view of how and why Africa and its people's histories have been ignored, showing how their exploitation brought ecological dividends that then reshaped the world. And the author and journalist Howard French is still with me on the line from New York. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us. Uh, and you were talking before we went on break about how things degenerated um, for people of African descent. I mean, your book notes that the Europeans recognized the preeminence of African societies because there was a fairly constant flow of diplomats between the two sides and there were diplomatic and political relations between essentially 
two equals, not that of a superior over a subordinate. Yes, that's correct. And if uh, your previous question before the break, Charles, was about how did things deteriorate? And as I had begun to explain, um, you know, history everywhere uh, for all human societies involves countless uh, what, what we might call accidents or coincidences of timing. And the big tragic coincidence of timing that takes place in this era in African history is that one of the great, uh, perhaps the greatest uh, uh, African empire uh, of the late Middle Ages um, comes under attack and ultimately succumbs uh, to an attack by Morocco, and we're speaking of the Mali Empire, home to Mansa Musa, the famously rich king that I began to speak of in the beginning of my remarks. Uh, and this takes place just on the eve of the arrival of the Portuguese uh, in, in the West African environment. And so a political force that uh, had vast territorial holdings and commanded very large armies and might have been in a position to uh, do more to uh, to stand up to your, uh, nascent European imperialism was dissolving just at the time when the imperial era was beginning. Um, another great coincidence, um, also equally tragic, a bit later, um, uh, sort of at the beginning of the 16th century, was the arrival of Portuguese in Congo, where there was another great kingdom. And the coincidence involved here uh, has, has it that the Congolese um, uh, believed in uh, or, or held as one of their most sacred holy symbols uh, something very much resembling the Christian cross. And so the Portuguese, of course, being uh, Catholics, arrived by sea on the coast of Congo with ships that bore the cross on their, on their sails and sometimes on uh, their hulls. And the, and the Congolese took this to be a divine omen uh, and opened themselves up to Portuguese penetration uh, in, a way, in a way that they might not have otherwise had there not been this incredible coincidence. And so they, these two kingdoms, the Portuguese and the Congolese, uh, treat as equals for about uh, half a century, in fact. But as Portuguese custom, Portuguese religion, and even the Portuguese language, which becomes the official court language of Congo um, in, in, in both speech and writing, take hold in the Congo, the, Congo, the Portuguese, uh, just uh, around that time, discover Brazil, discover, of course, needs to be in quotation marks, uh, and decide that it's the exportation of slaves from Africa that is their priority and no longer trade in metals and other kinds of resources with Africa. And they begin to undermine the Congolese empire. And after a very long struggle, which involves remarkable world alliances, the Congolese uh, uh, king um, makes an alliance with the Dutch uh, to fight what amounts to a world war in the 16th century against the Portuguese and the Spaniards. Uh, Congolese fight with, with the Dutch at sea and on land in Central Africa and in Brazil. Um, but ultimately, um, the Iberians prevail uh, and the Congolese kingdom is undone. And so Congo, like what is now Nigeria, um, those territories in these two parts of West and Central Africa then become the most important supply sources for enslaved people in the New World. Well, that's very interesting. But I mean, to, to so really, this intentional obliteration of the role of Africa in the creation of modernity. I mean, that, that's the, the point I really want to get to. So because of this new sort of the, the demands of the new world and so on and so forth, um, the, the, there was this ration, I mean, they tried to rationalize um, or, or, you know, to justify things like slave trade in particular and the European treatment of Africa in general over the centuries, um, that was why things went down, was it? And, and you make that point in your book? Yes. So the obliteration, I think, can be traced directly to the unspeakable bestiality of the European treatment of Africa, uh, or of Africans, I should say. Um, uh, Europeans took slaves from Africa in great number, uh, mostly via trade. Uh, and sent them to the New World. And the people who defend or would attempt to defend 
uh, Europeans from any historical criticism say, yes, but Africans also traded in slaves, or yes, the Africans sold us slaves. The fact is that slavery is a common experience of all human societies, and emphasize all at various stages of development, but that the institution of slavery as practiced by the Europeans in the era that we we're talking about was utterly unfamiliar to Africans. It is what I called at the outset of our conversation, chattel slavery. Chattel has the same root uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, etymologically speaking as cattle, the word cattle or beast. And, and, and that's a um, very important distinction that you make there. That's the difference between indentured servitude and chattel slavery. So really what Europe and America did to Africa was so shockingly, dreadfully horrible, that the only way they could absolve themselves was to project this emptiness and this vacuousness on Africa and to suggest that it was inferior, even though that had no merit and had absolutely no substance at all. That's exactly right. Um, it, it should also be said that if it is true that African societies had slaves, and that is true, and that African societies traded in slaves, the African conception of slavery in the late Middle Ages and in the early modern era was uh, based on a notion that the wealth and power of a kingdom was based on the number of people that fit within the polity, within the society. And so the acquisition of slaves was not met as a, a measure of agricultural production per se, or how much labor you could extract from them, but a, a measure of how large the society became. And the African societies took the leaders of these societies took it as their uh, principal motivation to integrate slaves into their societies as quickly as possible. In chattel societies, um, in, in, under the chattel model in the New World, in Brazil, in Barbados, in Jamaica, in Haiti, in the American South, what is known as slave societies were created, where a half or maybe even in some instances three quarters or more of the people inhabitants of any of these societies were in fact enslaved black people with the minority consisting of white people. In history, there have only been a handful of instances of true slave societies where all of the labor in the society essentially is derived from slaves which constitute a racial or national ma ma majority atop of which sits a racial or national minority uh, such as we have in this, in, in this instance. Uh, we're almost out of time. We've got about 20 seconds. Uh, I was going to ask you how much it concerns you that Africa is now essentially doing to itself what the Europeans did to it. But unfortunately, we're out of time. But hopefully, we'll have you back another day. Fascinating book. Fascinating interview. Uh, that was, of course, Howard French, author of uh, the new book, uh, joining me there from uh, New York. That's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Join us again tomorrow. From me and the entire team here in Abuja and around the world, bye-bye and thank you for watching.